Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this block on neuromuscular and demyelinating disorders. Thank you so much to Dr. Willis for her lecture on multiple sclerosis and Dr. Edward Kelly Maracek for his expertise on neuropathology. I'm Saurabh Shukla, I'm the block leader for this course and contributor for neuromuscular lectures, guided case reviews, and pre and post test assessment. Our course overview consists of peripheral neuropathy, motor neuron disease, myasthenia gravis, immune mediated myopathy, and multiple sclerosis. Let's start with peripheral neuropathy. Peripheral neuropathies could be considered as length dependent or non length dependent. They can be divided as axonal or demyelinating neuropathies, large fibers or small fiber neuropathies, motor or sensory neuropathy, or hereditary or acquired forms of neuropathy. Time course is very important to determine diagnosis, which could include hyperacute, acute onset, early subacute, late subacute, to chronic forms of neuropathies with their respective time ranges as classified here, ranging from hyperacute that would start within 24 hours to acute within the first week, early subacute from a week to around two to three months, late subacute form around three months to six months, and a chronic neuropathy that progresses over six months. Our first important neuropathy to discuss is an acute inflammatory demyelinating polyradicular neuropathy, or what we commonly call as Gullian Barr syndrome. The most common cause of acute subacute placid weakness worldwide now as polio is on the decline. Its incidence is 0.5 to 2 cases per 100,000 and the lifetime risk is around less than 1 per 1,000. Mortality is 3 to 7 percent among those cases and this is due to infections, respiratory decline or autonomic dysfunction. It has a diagnostic criteria by Brighton collaboration. This is characterized by bilateral and flaccid symmetric weakness of the limbs, decreased or absent deep tendon reflexes in the weak limbs, monophasic illness pattern with interval from onset to nadir of weakness between 12 hours and 28 days and subsequent clinical plateau. Electrophysiological findings consistent with GBS, which would include albuminocytological dissociation in CSF, and nerve conduction study changes of demyelinating neuropathy or sometimes axonal changes in the cases of some of the GBS variants. Of course, there has to be an absence of an identifiable alternative diagnosis. There are other features of Bullion Barr syndrome which include relative symmetry of weakness and sensory loss. Sensory symptoms and signs, if present, are less impressive than weakness. Pain is common often in the back and the legs. Dysautonomia is common. 20% of these cases may have facial weakness. Some may also have ophthalmoplegia. Phrenic neuropathy is seen in 30% cases leading to diaphragmatic paralysis leading to respiratory weakness. And most cases have CSF cell count of less than five cells, but in around 10 to 15% cases, this may be up to 50 as well. On MRI of the spine, cord equina root enhancements are sometimes seen. Remember, GBS is also a polyradiculopathy. Management principles. Intravenous immunoglobulin as immunomodulatory agents are used that bind and neutralize the pathogenic antibodies. Ventilatory management, DVT prophylaxis, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and management of the autonomic dysfunction is very important for an inpatient admission of GBS. 87% of patients improve completely or have minor deficits like foot weakness or pain, most of them by one year, but some may take up to three years for recovery. Poor prognostic factors include old age, severe weakness at time of onset, or respiratory failure within few days of onset. We'll briefly talk about the chronic form here, the chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyradicular neuropathy. It's a demyelinating neuropathy with progressive or relapsing course over eight weeks and beyond, characterized by proximal and distal weakness and numbness, hyporeflexia or areflexia, now, CIDP has no facial weakness or dysautonomia or any respiratory weakness in the majority of patients. Prominent sensory signs are seen in CIDP patients as against the acute form GBS. 
incidence is 1 to 9 per 100,000 and 5 to 15 percent of CIDP cases may actually present acutely as GBS. So when a pre patient presents with acute demyelinating neuropathy, we are presuming that this is GBS, but a long-term follow-up is needed to find out if more such attacks happen and could that be then classified as not a acute demyelinating neuropathy, but a chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyradiculoneuropathy, which is CIDP. Another form of neuropathy is the immune vascular paraneoplastic forms of exonal neuropathy. These exonal neuropathies are asymmetric, patchy, and non-length dependent. Typical term that we use is a multiple mononeuropathy or a mononeuropathy multiplex type of presentation. These have early subacute onset with rapid progression over a few weeks. Over longer time, there's involvement of multiple nerves in both limbs, upper and lower, right and left, and this can actually result in a confluent pattern that mimics a generalized asymmetric neuropathy. Steroids are the mainstay of treatment in these acute to subacute exonal neuropathies. Immunosuppressants like cytoxan also are used. Plasma exchange or IVIG can also be used as part of acute treatment. Common causes. In the subacute presentation, we have primary or secondary vasculitis leading to neuropathy due to nerve ischemia. Neuropathy related to systemic inflammatory disorders like lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, or scleroderma also fall into this category. Paraproteinemic neuropathies, which are seen in lymphoid or hematological malignancies due to abnormal immunoglobulin, can also cause a subacute presentation of these exonal neuropathies. Acute presentations are seen in paraneoplastic neuropathy or sometimes neuropathy due to inflammatory bowel disease like celiac disease. There are chronic exonal forms of neuropathy which affect the sensory and the motor nerve fibers. These are the typical neuropathies that you see in clinical settings. They have the glove and stocking type of length dependent pattern. Sensory symptoms typically predominate and these are commonly seen in diabetes, vitamin B12, folate, thiamine deficiencies, or paraproteinemias due to hematological or lymphoid cancers. Also seen in patients who are using chemotherapy medications, alcoholics, patients with uremia, rarely heavy metal toxicity. Sensory responses usually deteriorate significantly before motor reduction emerging on nerve conduction studies. These are your typical glove and stocking type of neuropathies that you would see in clinics. Hereditary neuropathies. Hereditary motor and sensory neuropathy, also known as charcot marie tooth disease, is a common form. Other forms are hereditary sensory autonomic neuropathy, and then polyneuropathy is associated with systemic genetic disorders. These patients typically have neuropathies and result in muscle loss for decades, and that's the reason you would see high arches and hammer toes or claw toes and the heel turning inwards. These are all signs of intrinsic foot muscle loss that has happened over several years. Of course, you will have a family history, slowly progressive course since childhood. So this was a short presentation on neuropathy. Next, we'll talk about ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or what we commonly also call as motor neuron disease. The term ALS comes from muscle atrophy or amyotrophy due to denervation and then scarring and hardening, which is sclerosis of the lateral portions of the spinal cord in the corticospinal tract. It has a multifactorial pathology. This includes genetic. We know that there is some abnormal expansion in the hexanucleotide repeats, C9 ORF72 mutations, which have been known to be associated with patients of ALS. Genes affected like SOD1 gene mutations are related to impaired protein processing. Mutations in the TDP43 and the FUS gene are associated with impaired RNA processing. There's also theory about immune dysregulation leading to ALS, and there are some yet to be determined environmental factors. So it's a multifactorial etiology, some of which they still need to be researched. Before understanding the clinical presentation of ALS, it's important to understand what are upper and lower motor neurons. 
The upper motor neurons reside in the primary motor cortex of the brain and their axons comprise the corticobulbar tract and the corticospinal tract. The upper motor neuron weakness is caused by loss of downgoing inhibition in the corticobulbar and corticospinal tract. Lower motor neurons, also referred as anterior horn cells, are in the motor nuclei in the brain stem or the anterior gray matter of the spinal cord. Their axons connect to muscles of the bulbar region or limbs. Lower motor neuron weakness is caused by damage to these anterior horn cells and their axons. Clinical features of ALS can be divided as number one, upper motor neuron dysfunction. This is characterized by increased tone, spasticity, slowness of movements, hyperreflexia, and pathological reflexes. It's also characterized by cognitive decline and features of pseudobulbar effect. Pseudobulbar effect stands for abnormal laughing or crying at situations where you would normally not do those things. Number two, lower motor neuron dysfunction. This is characterized by pure motor weakness, reduced reflexes, muscle atrophy, fasciculations, and cramping. Number three, bulbar weakness. Now, this could be a combination of both upper and lower motor neuron dysfunction, characterized by spastic dysarthria and dysphonia, laryngospasm, involuntary cheek, or tongue biting or brisk jaw jerk. Flaccid dysarthria, where there's weakness of lingual, facial, and palatal muscles. Now, these cause an imprecise, breathy, and hypernasal speech. The facial weakness and dysphagia often lead to sialuria and difficulty managing the secretions. Number four is respiratory insufficiency, characterized by shortness of breath, orthopnea, and reduced vocal volume. Diagnostic tests for ALS include nerve conduction studies, which show preservation of sensory responses with normal or reduced motor amplitudes. Needle electromyography, very important. This shows active denovation along with chronic renovation changes in multiple myotomes, right? The Lou Gehrig's disease or ALS motor neuron disease affects the motor neurons and or their axons, and that's what is causing the denervation changes. MRI of the neuroaxis is very important to rule out any other cause of upper motor neuron dysfunction. We also do CSF testing sometimes, especially in lower motor neuron dysfunction cases. And this is mainly done to rule out any kind of immune mediated neuropathies or infectious causes of motor neuron disease or cancers. Currently, ALS has no cure. There are few disease modifying options with limited efficacy, which are FDA approved. These include Riluzol, which is an inhibitor of neuronal glutaminergic transmission, and edaveron, which is a free radical scavenger that reduces oxidative stress. Much of the focus of ALS care centers is on multidisciplinary management of symptoms. We'll next move on to myasthenia gravis, which is a postsynaptic neuromuscular junction disorder. It's an autoimmune condition. It's painless, fluctuating, and fatigable weakness that characterizes this disease. We'll try and understand how does a neuromuscular junction transmission work. So first, you have a nerve action potential that reaches the neuromuscular junction. The calcium channel gets activated and causes endocytosis of calcium in the presynaptic terminal. There's release of acetylcholine from vesicles. Then, this acetylcholine binds to receptors at the postsynaptic junction. These are the acetylcholine receptors. Once this binding happens, the sodium channels get activated on the postsynaptic membrane and muscle end plate potential is generated. And this muscle end plate potential then propagates and eventually breaks a certain threshold to become what is called a muscle fiber action potential. And this leads to our muscle contraction. Eventually, the acetylcholine is degraded in the neuromuscular junction area by choline esterase enzyme. Clinical features of myasthenia gravis? Let's see how they happen. They happen because acetylcholine receptors or musk receptor antibodies prevent effective neuromuscular junction transmission. You may have enough acetylcholine in the neuromuscular junction, but if their postsynaptic junctions are blocked, the neuromuscular junction transmission is impaired, and this leads to ptosis, you know, which is frequently asymmetric, and this also causes binocular diplopia. 
It can cause face and bulbar weakness characterized by flaccid dysarthria, dysphagia, jaw closer weakness, weak smile, nasal speech, jaw fatigue, especially when chewing harder foods for longer time. It can cause neck weakness characterized by neck flexion weakness. This can cause proximal and symmetric weakness in the limbs, often fatigable. Myasthenic crisis is a neuromuscular emergency and this could occur in about 15% of patients. This is characterized by severe progressive weakness that has now started to affect the diaphragm and accessory breathing muscles causing respiratory failure. This is an emergency that needs to be recognized promptly and offer elective ventilation on a clinical diagnosis without actually waiting for blood gas changes to show hypoxemia. This is managed in an ICU setting with ventilatory support and treatment with plasma exchange. IVIG is also okay if plasma exchange is not available, but plasma exchange is always preferred. What are the factors that exacerbate myasthenia? These include surgery, pregnancy and postpartum period, heat, stress, viral infections, bone marrow transplantation, and certain medications. MGFA or Myasthenia Gravis Foundation of America runs a great website that keeps itself updated with a list of medications that could potentially worsen myasthenia. We have a list of some medications here. Now, except for telethromycin, which has a black box warning, a lot of these medications are relative contraindications. So when you see some of these patients on, on the medicines, you don't have to stop unless initiation of these medicines significantly worsen their myasthenia. What we do is we suggest patients that if reasonable alternatives exist, they can talk to their primary doctors or other doctors who have started these medicines to consider those alternatives. But if a patient absolutely needs these medicines, yes, we are okay then starting it and we closely monitor. If they decline, then we can pull the plug and move to something else. So these are to a large extent relative contraindications. Ice pack bedside test is a cool bedside test. Now, all of us know that cold impairs function of enzyme, all enzymes. And similarly, the cholinesterase enzyme function is also impaired with cold. This is the enzyme, remember, that breaks down acetylcholine into acetate and choline. So if the function of this enzyme is compromised, acetylcholine wouldn't be broken down and you'll have lots of acetylcholine in the neuromuscular junction, which can then act on the available receptors for a longer time. And that's the reason an ice pack test helps improve ptosis in patients with myasthenia gravis. We use nerve conduction studies to diagnose myasthenia. One test that we use is a repetitive nerve stimulation testing. Now this demonstrates decremental signal response with repeating nerve stimulations. Now as you give more stimuli, the amplitude of the response keeps going down. And this is an electrophysiological correlate of fatigable weakness. We of course do lab work to check for myasthenia antibodies, the acetylcholine and the musk receptor antibodies. There are some others as well. We do a CT scan of the chest to make sure there's no thymoma. Thymoma is found in about 15% of patients with myasthenia gravis and should always be surgically removed. It is thought that some of these myasthenia antibodies are created there. Sometimes we have to do a single fiber EMG to diagnose myasthenia gravis. And this looks for abnormal excess variability of the interpotential intervals between two muscle fiber pairs in a motor unit. Now this difference or variability happens because there is a non-uniform neuromuscular junction signal transmission between two muscle fibers in a single motor unit because the neuromuscular junction is blocked. So it may be blocked more in one muscle fiber, a little less in the other one. So that's why there is a variability in neuromuscular junction transmission. And this test uses this principle to diagnose myasthenia. What are our treatment goals? Treatment goals are that should be achieved with minimal possible side effects from medications. One is remission. You know, you want absolutely no signs or symptoms of myasthenic weakness. Or 
sometimes we settle with minimal manifestations like having no subjective symptoms but only mild or to minimal objective weakness. What is the treatment during crises? Plasma exchange and IVIG are rapid onset short-term immunotherapy for severe acute exacerbations and sometimes they are also given preoperatively to optimize the patient's strength prior to a surgery. Rarely in refractory patients and in patients who do not respond to or cannot tolerate oral immunosuppressants, then IVIG can be used chronically as well. Plasma exchange remains the treatment of choice in true myasthenic crises because of its fast onset. Usually after second or third plasma exchange, it starts showing its benefit. Plasma exchange, however, is contraindicated in sepsis and patients with severe hypotension. Complications in plasma exchange are mostly related to the use of central venous catheters or fluid channels. Pyridostigmin or mestinon is an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor. Now this is used for symptom management alone in purely ocular as well as mild generalized cases or this is used in combination with immunosuppressants in more severe cases. The symptomatic benefit starts in 30 to 60 minutes and lasts around 3 to 4 hours. That's why Mestinon or pyridostigmin, a 60 milligram tablet, is taken every four hours in myasthenia patients. Common side effects include abdominal cramps, diarrhea, and excessive lacrimation. Prednisone, because of its universal and rapid onset of effects in two to three weeks, steroids are usually the first choice for patients with ocular and generalized myasthenia who require something more than pyridostigmin alone. Now, prednisone in clinics is started as a slow taper and then we gradually go up on the dose. Whereas if patient is admitted, especially in an ICU setting, you can go up to the target dose much quickly. We do slow taper in clinics because there's a possible risk of short-term exacerbation, especially in bulbar and respiratory weakness. That's why in a clinical setting, we usually start at around 10, 10 to 15 milligram a day and then gradually build up the dose to a gram per kilogram as needed and then again scale back down based on symptoms whereas if a patient is intubated and getting plasma exchange or IVIG in an ICU setting we can go up to 50 or 60 milligram a day dose very quickly. Long-term immunomodulators are important in management of generalized myasthenia because they spare the body of steroids. Commonly used are mycophenolate mofetil, which inhibits cell-mediated immunity, azathioprine, which is sex mercaptopurin that inhibits lymphocyte proliferation. We sometimes now also use rituximab, especially in musk myasthenia cases. This is an anti-CD20 antibody that depletes the count of CD20 B lymphocytes. Now, these lymphocytes are thought to secrete the musk antibodies. These are IgG4 antibodies secreted from these cells and rituximab acts against these cells. In recent times, ecudizumab, which is a complement inhibitor, has also been used in myasthenia labs. Next, we'll talk about inflammatory myopathies. These include dermatomyositis, antisynthetase syndrome, immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy, overlap myositis, and polymyositis. Inflammatory myopathies are a diverse group of heterogeneous muscle diseases traditionally characterized by muscle weakness, elevation in muscle enzymes, and inflammation on muscle biopsies. The severity, extramuscular manifestations, and risk of malignancy may vary among the subtypes of autoimmune myopathies. Several immunotherapeutic options now exist that can be selected to target specific subtypes, often with a favorable prognosis especially when treatment is started early in the disease course. Weakness and inflammatory myopathy. Limb weakness is symmetric and proximal, often involving the proximal shoulder and hip girdle muscles with progression. It may also affect the truncal muscles. It's characterized by neck flexor weakness, pharyngeal weakness. Now in advanced stages, there could also be respiratory muscle weakness. There's often diffuse myalgia and muscle tenderness. We talk about dermatomyositis. This is characterized by muscle inflammation and skin rash, as its name suggests. It can also affect the heart, causing rhythm or pump dysfunction or pericarditis or myocarditis. It can cause restrictive lung disease. It can cause swallow difficulty, or it can also cause vasculopathy, leading to GI ulcers. 
Sometimes dermatomyositis is a paraneoplastic condition, so it's important to look for hidden cancers. Sometimes it can also cause joint pains with or without having an associated arthritis. These are some pictures of patients with dermatomyositis with specific rashes. First among them is a heliotrope rash. You see the purplish red discoloration of the skin over the upper eyelid. There's also erythema noted over the malar region. The second picture here shows a V sign where there's erythematous cutaneous changes seen in a V distribution over the anterior neck. And then you have a patient with shawl sign showing erythema noted over the posterior neck upper back area. These are pictures showing number one, the Gautron sign, which is scaling erythematous changes noted over the metacarpophalangeal joints, proximal and distal interpharyngeal joints as well. And you could see some hemorrhages at the nail beds with irregular thickened cuticles. Diagnostic workup, usually you would see elevated creatinine kinase, but sometimes can also be normal. So not used to track disease progression and severity. Other serum biomarkers of muscle injury that we check include aldolase, LDH, and also AST and ALT. Remember, these AST and ALT are also muscle enzymes, not just liver enzymes. When you do needle electromyography, that will show myopathic changes on EMG. Muscle biopsy in these patients show perifascicular inflammation, and muscle MRI, or typically MRI of the femur or MRI of the shoulder area, would show edema, atrophy and calcification. On blood work, we order myositis-specific antibodies in the myomarker panel that you will see us ordering in the clinics. Now, these have some specific antibodies which have some specific clinical features and whether favorable or unfavorable response to immunotherapy. Some of them, as you see, the anti-TIF is also strongly associated with cancers. You really need to look at cancer with CT chest abdominal pelvis or PET scan. Anti-NXP2 is also increased risk of malignancy. There are some that have more common skin rashes with mild muscle involvement like the anti-SAD. So checking the myomarker panel can give you some idea about clinical presentation prognosis and the risk of malignancy. Muscle MRI, here we have an image of thigh muscle MRI for patient with severe dermatomyositis. In image A, you could see the hyperintensity through the subcutaneous tissue, the red arrow here in the coronal section. The axial image in B of the thigh shows marked muscle atrophy, the blue arrow, indicating severe disease and then subcutaneous calcification in the posterior area, the hypointensity, the yellow arrow. This is the muscle biopsy of a patient with dermatomyositis. This is the H and E stain. And these arrows show small atrophic muscle fibers in a perifascicular distribution, which is so specific for dermatomyositis. And you could see inflammatory cells as well. This is another slide picture showing the perifascicular atrophy. Now, this perifascicular atrophy is thought to be caused from microinfaction, which is mediated by blood vessel dysfunction. You could see a lot of inflammatory cells here. And you could see invasion of necrotic fibers. The pathophysiology is thought as occurring because of two possible scenarios. One is a vasculopathy, which is complement mediated. The terminal complement C5B9 MAC is found in the vessel walls before the appearance of inflammatory cells. Now it is yet to be explored whether vasculopathy is mediated purely by complement or if the deposition of complement proteins is some sort of a immune mediated process going on and the complement is just a secondary to that. Another pathophysiology is about interferons. Interferon overproduction has been a proposed mechanism of the pathology seen in dermatomyositis. Dermatomyositis muscles have been shown to contain abundant interferon secreting plasmacytoid dendritic cells near the perifascicular and perifascicular areas. 
Additionally, interferon inducible genes are highly upregulated in dermatomyositis. And the gene expression in the blood correlates with dermatomyositis disease activity. The mechanism of interferon overproduction that is leading to the loss of capillaries and this perifascicular atrophy still remains unclear, but we have two possible pathophysiologies. One, as I said, is a complement mediated process and the other one is an interferon mediated process. Another subtype here is antisynthetase syndrome. This is an inflammatory myopathy characterized by muscle weakness, which may or may not be seen earlier in the course. What is important is these patients have interstitial lung disease. They have arthritis, fever, they could have Raynaud's syndrome and mechanics hands. They could have skin rashes like dermatomyositis patients. Now, this presentation is associated with a very specific serum autoantibody to the amino acid tRNA synthetase. That's why it's called an antisynthetase. Next, we move to immune mediated necrotizing myopathy. This is an acute to subacute severe proximal muscle weakness with very rare extra muscular involvement. Less than 10% cases will have lung or skin or joint involvement. These patients have markedly elevated CK levels, which may precede the onset of weakness. Thus, this can be used to detect exacerbations of disease when therapy is being weaned or changed. And interestingly, the CK levels could normalize in patients with long-standing disease due to replacement of muscle by fat and atrophy, even with ongoing disease activity. That's why creatine and kinase is not the only thing that we go by. Looking at their exam, changes in their exam, and close clinic follow-up is also important. Needle electromyography in these patients would show muscle membrane irritability, features of myopathy. Immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy is seen in patients who are taking statins. That's why it's important to check anti-HMG coenzyme antibody. Anti-SRP antibodies can also cause this. And interestingly, immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy can also be a paraneoplastic phenomenon. That's why it's very important to screen for cancer. This is a muscle biopsy of a patient with anti-3-hydroxy-3-methyl-uteral coenzyme A reductase immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy. You know, this can happen in patients who are taking statins. This is the 3-HMG coenzyme A antibody-mediated disease. You could see necrosis and degeneration in muscle fibers, but you don't see many lymphocytoid endomycial cells. There's not much endomycial inflammation going on here. There's more of necrosis and degeneration. The other category here is overlap myositis. This myositis is seen with connective tissue disorders like lupus, scleroderma, rheumatoid arthritis, Jogren syndrome, or mixed connective tissue disorder. Among all forms of inflammatory myopathies, this is the one that has a better treatment response and better prognosis. This could be associated with several myositis associated antibodies like Row 52, PMSCL, anti KU antibodies, and anti U1 RNP antibodies. These antibodies can help you understand what could be the primary connective tissue disorder causing the inflammatory myopathy. Polymyositis. Now, this is another form. Historically, polymyositis has been characterized by a subacute onset of proximal muscle weakness, elevation of CK, myopathic EMG, and endomycial inflammation with CD8 positive T7 filtrates on muscle biopsy. Over the years, it has been increasingly recognized that polymyositis is a much rare entity because many of the patients who were initially diagnosed with just polymyositis, subsequently we end up finding that these patients either had dermatomyositis or antisynthetase syndrome. Some of them had an inclusion body myopathy or they just had immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy. Therefore, the diagnosis of polymyositis is now seen as a diagnosis of exclusion. This is a pathology slide. It shows an interstitial infiltrate with myocyte degeneration. As you see, the cellular infiltrate is predominantly within the fascicles here. And then abnormal necrotic and regenerating muscle fibers are scattered throughout. Treatment of immune-mediated myopathies, you could divide them into mild weakness and moderate to severe weakness. Steroids remain the overset. We gradually start them and go up to a milligram per kilogram day dose. 
and then long-term treatment is important in these patients you want them to have as less of steroid dose as possible and that's why use of steroid sparing agents like azathioprine or salcept which is mycophenolate mofetil or methotrexase is important sometimes during acute to subacute worsening of disease we have to use ivig in these patients for patients where long-term immunomodulators like azathioprine or mycophenolate mofetil or methotrexate don't work we sometimes have to use rituximab or cyclophosphamide as well 